they must make you know millions of pounds every second. So if you could, if they can keep you in that bank with your handcuff stamp scribbling away, <laughs> they've just made themselves a million dollars. <laughs> wow. Hello and welcome to the Abroad Japan podcast, probably the best way of learning about life in Japan without actually being in Japan. I'm your host Chris Broad, and we're joined as always by England's top Japan enthusiast, Mr. Pete Donaldson himself. Pete, how the devil are you doing? What's going on? I'm very good. I mean, I, I want to let people through the uh, through the curtain. Uh, we are recording the day before uh, this show goes out, and uh, it's we're on the eve of the big football Euros final. Uh, England are in the final Yay. with Spain. We're hopefully going to be beating them. Um, and I actually had a weird. I just woke up from a dream where I was in. The Euros. I was in the England team. <laughs> Playing. How yeah. much of a like a little boy's dream was that this morning? To have a little dream. <laughs> dream a little dream about being in the Euros. Um, but the Euros had, be- had lost some of its luster. Um, mm. And it turns out we were just, me and uh, the other England players, were just kicking around a, um, a little earbud from um, a Sony uh, MX-5 um, setup, um, uh, and, and that was getting televised. But every time we'd get to a certain point in the match, we'd have to move to another room to kick this tiny earbud around. Um, but I still had that kind of, like, pride to be English and proud proud to play for the English team uh, and to play soccer professionally. Um, it was a really... Lovely little dream. I had yeah, this morning. <laughs> I think you need some some help sometimes. Pete. I do I need some help. I yes, can't talk. Even my dream you can't last talk. week with the snake and whatever was going on there. But yeah, I mean, that's a bit a bit odd. But I guess it's a timely dream to have, isn't it? Yeah. Anyways, but uh, yeah, go little boy's dream. Are yeah. we going to win, Pete? What's your prediction? You're the football um, guy. I predicted that we'd go very deep in the tournament. I actually predicted that we'd win, uh, but I perhaps hadn't seen Spain play at that point. So it's going to be Gareth Southgate, the manager's um, you know, crowning achievement to beat Spain and uh, to beat the Spanish side uh, and to, to win the whole thing. But it's not something we've won. We've not won anything since 1966, so it's quite a big deal. Jesus, yeah. um, and... Um, in spite of the awful English fans who are frequently uh, problematic out and about, um, I just hope like everyone yourself, has a nice time. <laughs> Myself, people like there's people who don't live on these aisles. Um, there's a real kind of um, there's, a, there's a real kind of uh, uh, interest in England fans when they score. They throw their pints of beer in the air, and um, <laughs> you just can't get away with that behaviour when you're in a capital city because the beers are so expensive. You got to be very careful. It's Norway level in 2024. Oh That's how expensive the uh, the beers are. But uh, yes, good luck to Gareth and his boys. Um, but by the time you're hearing this, it will have already happened. And I'll either be drunk as a skunk and a monk, <laughs> or are uh, very much, uh, yeah, very much just um, having a well, sleep. I imagine you'll be drunk no matter what happens. I'm sure. But exactly. yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. They have. <laughs> It'd be nice to actually win something for the first time in. 50 years, or whatever he yeah. said, 1966, right? Bloody hell. And uh, a nice little win wow. for my new best friend, Keir Starmer, a Prime Minister <laughs> of the UK. Uh, if he uh, wins, it'll be good for him, won't it? Like, riding the wave of national euphoria. Just what he yeah. needs, just what he needs. It'll be, it'll be great. It will be... Um, he's one of the very few Kias in the world, isn't he? Kia. How many other Kias yeah. are there, for crying out loud? I don't know. When I, when I spoke to him... <laughs> In Buckingham Palace, as, as you may have Yeah, well, I was chatting to Kieran at uh, 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 BP. He was walking, he was walking, it was just me and him in a room, a big mm. f- empty banquet room, essentially. And Hello, Chris! Walking around, not quite knowing what to do with himself. And I didn't know mm. what to say, I didn't know, oh, Kier, how you doing, mate? Mm. Or Mr. Starmer, or Lord Starmer, because he's a DJ Starmzos, can you get me those nuclear codes, please? <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I really, I, I keep reliving the moment I spoke to Keir Starmer with the mm. knowledge that he was in all likelihood going to be the Prime Minister the week after. Yeah. I keep thinking, fuck, why didn't I say anything good or get any like interesting things Demand out tax of breaks for YouTubers. I know, right? Can you lower the tax rate? Can, can, <laughs> can you lower the tax rate for YouTubers, YouTubers in Japan? Please, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I wish like, I'd said something good and I didn't. I think I cracked a joke about Nigel Farage and that was it. Real missed opportunity. Do you not think that? Do you not think that you experienced this same thing that um, the the rarefied atmosphere of meeting someone you've you know a celebrity basically, and you meet them and you feel like you've got to say something important, and you know something that stands apart from every other kind of conversation he's had with somebody. Mm, mm. Um, and if everyone's doing that, the celebrities must live in a weird world where people will just go. 
just panic and just shout like bonanza and stuff like they must like <laughs> I've been they must about because that, yeah. every encounter with normal normal people they must be kind of like they, they must just sort of think god everyone's <laughs> insane because they just keep crying and panicking and screaming i do th- i did think i mean my my encounter with him would have been instantly forgotten in the many encounters he had that day and that week and i did mm. think like what could i say or do who that could yeah. make him remember that encounter, but it would be something awful, like me just throw a beer all over his face, or me go, yeah. ah, ah, bananas, and just <laughs> shout something. It's right. kind of like, it's probably for the best I didn't do any of those things. That's uh, yeah. probably for the best. <laughs> probably for the best. But uh, probably the best. I am jet-lagged. I've just got back from Canada. Had a little week, week-long holiday over in Canada, seeing Charlotte's family, and Ooh. just sitting by like a swimming pool for a few days, which was pleasant. And that's why I look nice and tan for the first time in a while but yeah really? I, my head's exploded because I, the fucking west coast north america right the uh the time zone difference it's like 16 hours behind mm. and you really you just can't compute that it just my no. head's just so messed up so i don't envy people that have to travel between west coast and japan often because it really does screw the, with your head the, the only good thing is i uh i've been waking up early since yesterday uh. i've been getting up at like 6 a.m what the for just one time you, yeah, <laughs> i've been doing this thing once hmm, yeah but it will I've, happen tomorrow i've been going to the gym once um <laughs> uh like yeah but is that not kind of quite that's you've not done that for years because your usual kind of setup is editing until 3 a.m going to sleep getting up at like 10 and and coffeeing it throughout the rest of the day you know your right. your time zone is absolutely like spun on an axle so do you not think that like um this could be the new Chris, new you, like getting up really early in the morning and just enjoying Tokyo before it's really yeah. busy. It's cool. Like you, you wake up in Tokyo like at 7am no matter what you do because it's fucking noisy. There's always something right. going on. So it was nice to get up one hour before it gets noisy. And also I mm. woke up, I think I actually woke up at 530 and I dropped a message to American Pete about something, and he replied mm. instantly because, of course, he was going to bed, and it was like his one, <laughs> his one American man falls Pete. asleep, an idiot wakes <laughs> up just <laughs> down the road. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that was it was it was nice to be on the side where I get to wake up early for once. But yeah, the first it time that I it's definitely good to first... wake up early. It's definitely a good habit to have, I think. Oh yeah, I think my my new thing just because of work and stuff is that I'm getting up at like six in the morning, and it's and it is. <laughs> It is better, but I mean, you are going to bed at like ten o'clock, going uh, <laughs> tired, um, and you 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 know you finally get to sleep about you know um, twelve or, or after eleven or whatever. But I would say the first time that I went to Japan, um, I didn't really know time zones. I'm, I wasn't oh. a big traveller back then. I am now, but I wasn't a big traveller. And I travelled to Los Angeles for a holiday for a week, and then right. did a week in Tokyo. Um, so I experienced two absolutely crushing sets oh of, uh, God, of yeah. jet lag. But maybe as a younger man, I didn't really sort of notice it that much. But uh, I'm not sure I could do it today. I think I'd probably have heart palpitations. <laughs> well, so far, so good on my end. I'm doing all right. Yeah. Um, and I'm, as we, we'll see if I collapse halfway yeah. through this podcast as we good get on through you. it. But we've got a story this week from Mike from Connecticut in the US who says, Hello, Chris and Pete. My wife... 10-year-old daughter and I have been travelling in Japan, now on week three of a nine-week trip throughout the country. Jesus, that's a, that's a hell of a trip, Mike. Hope you're having a good yeah. one. Bloody hell. Awesome. Uh, recently in Fukuoka, we purchased some toothpaste and hand wipes in a drugstore. After checking out, the cashier asked us to step aside to an area next to the cash registers where, this, where there was a small line. People were showing their receipts and then spinning a small... <laughs> Spinning a small wooden box that dispensed wow. tiny coloured balls. They asked us to spin it once, which we did, and a little green ball fell out. This must have been the best colour, <laughs> because the store clerks cheered and rang a bell, eliciting smiles and gasps from others in the line. They gave us a small prize, a bag of potato chips, and two Genki drinks. The chips were delicious, but the drinks were medicinal in flavour, and absolutely shit. I imagine this was some sort of product promotion. It certainly seems quite popular with the other folks in the store. I'm wondering what are your thoughts on these vitamin medicinal drinks. I know you're a fan of the energy jelly, so is it possible some people like the flavour of these drinks? We love the podcast. Keep up the good work, guys. Mike from Connecticut with his uh, well, with his drink and his potato chip. Mystery medicine drink. Cool. Could it just have been medicine? Could they just be absolutely <laughs> piling down some, uh, some cough medicine? Yeah. Uh, they just experienced purple drank for the first time, whatever oh, they call it. Christ. Ugh. You know those medicinal <laughs> drinks, though, yeah, you get like... Uh, 
like a shot of caffeine in a glass bottle, right? And it looks mm. like medicine, but actually it's just like, it's just taurine, just lots of taurine. And, yeah. Uh, you get it in the energy jelly section. You, you get it also, those little um, bottles that um, the, the Japanese people uh, drink to stave off uh, hangovers, the ones with the picture of the liver on. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're pretty good as well. Always Maybe it's one of those. Of them down, yes. <laughs> hangover trick. Delicious. <laughs> I've never heard of the Genki drink. Presumably it just means like caffeine drink or whatever, but... I wonder what the health drink was. Uh, health drink, mm, I don't know. Delicious. But I mean, it's it's definitely quite common, these sort of things. And um, I remember, you know, it used to be, I don't know if it's the case now, but certainly in the first few years that I was here, mm. when I went to, out to like Izakaya pubs and bars, every now and then, like someone, um, someone would just walk in with a rucksack full of Marlboro cigarettes and they'd be like, they wouldn't, they wouldn't ask you to fill out a form or do anything. They'd mm. just go... What flavour do you want? Do you want strawberry, vanilla, or dandelion? And you just be like, oh, that one. And they just give you a pack mm. of cigarettes to try them out and just smoke them. And you just it get was the quite good at the time. Ten of them. And go, oh, <laughs> just get them down you. Oh. <laughs> like they they used to do that in. To be fair, they used to do that in literally the eighties or nineties in oh. uh, in the UK. You'd see sort of um, people, spokespeople for different cigarette brands, and they'd pop round and uh, they'd give you give you talk to you. I think you could exchange an empty pack. No, you, had to ex- you could exchange a pack that had one cigarette in um, for a full pack of um, promotional cigarettes, I believe. Right. So people would just take all of the cigarettes out of their packet, leave one in, and then hand it over as if to sort of go... I don't know whether that was a legal thing or just, a, you know, that's the way that's the way it's all always been done. But, uh, yeah, people used to just give away one cigarette and receive an entire pack back, wow. which is... Um, and, and smokers that I know um, talk about these days really romantically. <laughs> they go all sort of misty-eyed and look into the middle distance and go, oh, good, good days, great days. <laughs> well, to be fair, in my first three years here, I did, I did smoke a fair bit. Um, I don't know why. Um, well, it's quite, it was quite nice, actually. But <laughs> it's quite nice, quite uh, nice. I want one now. No, I, I've, I stopped like back in 2015. I think it was because... 6 a.m. cigarette, come on. Get I involved, never got Chris. that bad. I never, I never did morning smoking. It was more like a social smoking thing. But it was really nice. You know, you'd end the day, you'd go down the Izakaya pub. I think it's because the, the two folks I went down the pub with, Nelson and Dan, they mm. smoked like chimneys themselves. And I felt like, oh, I want one as well. I want to be the cool kid. No. But I did, I did smoke a bit before that at university. And it, it, yeah, it, it definitely went up a few notches being in Japan. Certainly when I met Natsuki, it went up a whole other level. But like, <laughs> it was nice getting a free, cig- a free pack of cigarettes. Yeah. Smoking away. And it looks um, cool. It was fun. It was the good, it was the good old days. It does look yeah. cool. I don't, know what, I don't care what people say. Smoking does look cool. It does look cool. And, and, it's and just it embedded even, in us. You know. And it's gone... <laughs> <laughs> and it's gone even like uh, you know it, it, it's probably um, about again 10 years ago people would be saying oh you know it's not you know smoking isn't cool who smokes anymore but because of vaping which looks probably lame because uh, it looks like you're sucking a, sucking a robot willy um, <laughs> and, and not, not, nothing against people who love robot willies um, so it, maybe it doesn't look lame it looks cool to them but um, it looks <laughs> it looks like uh, weird and uh, they uh, you would say that um, smoking it looks more rebellious now doesn't it so mm. yeah that's probably that's true. if I was going to take up something that's going to kill me it would be smoking because it looks <laughs> cool I know. Well, I know Natsuki did try vaping. And he's trying to get off smoking right. and failed. And what annoys me is Natsuki told me he did quit smoking successfully. And I think this was like mm. five, ten. I think it was like ten years ago or something. And I think he held off for like six months. And then he, but then oh. he said like he had a mental breakdown, and he had to like <laughs> stuff the marble cigarettes back in his mouth, and he was good to go, kind of thing. <laughs> it's. Um, yeah, I, was, I going on down the tangent of smoking here, but it's over the years I've I've thought like many times should I try and help Natsuki stop smoking and make a documentary about it? But yeah, it's, he just brings him so much joy. I know it's it's like <laughs> it's not very, doing his health any good, but it's very uh, it's it's one of those projects that you it would be a very long process, wouldn't it? And it wouldn't necessarily <laughs> be, be. and also it'll let you down because someone will see him smoking, going, hang on, t- people will be taking pictures of him smoking in the street, going. Hey, you smoke again? That's not allowed. Because <laughs> like when I was a kid, like my dad uh, used to smoke, not massively heavily, but um, when I was born, I had, I had asthma, so my dad um, quite uh, quite wonderfully sort of gave up. Oh, wow. um, and he and so, but every now and again, I'd catch him having a crafty fag, and that felt like 
the most frightening thing in the world, sort of seeing your dad smoke because obviously you know the health implications. Mm, um, mm. But it used to be absolute. At, at any time I caught wind of my dad stinking a smoke, it used to absolutely, uh, you know, destroy my world because I was a you know little little flower, little precious little delicate flower back in the day. But it, yeah, it's still weird. Are, still are people. But because I think I, I think when you I guess when when my mum and dad became parents, nobody sort of says. Don't freak out your kids. <laughs> Don't freak out your kids. <laughs> and so my mum and dad were like, do not have sex because you'll have a baby. And you don't want a baby because they're the worst. Um, and don't smoke because you'll <laughs> literally die the next day. And all this stuff kind of gets put in your subconscious. And, you know, the moment your mum and dad, you fuck, they, they, they fuck you up, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be careful how you talk to them. Indeed. Well, I mean, I, we your, had a, and your dad had a killer robot. That's right. Yeah, we had the killer <laughs> robot story a few weeks ago. About how my dad blew my university tuition on a killer fucking robot. <laughs> anyway, in the we we turn our attention to technology from killer robots Ooh, to yeah. less frightening technology. Japan has finally got rid of a key piece of technology that everyone from the nineties will fondly recall. Pete, hmm. what's going on? What's there? You go. That's how you. That's how you do the do the new story title without yeah. revealing what we're talking about. Secret. He's learning this one. Uh, Japan's government has finally eliminated the use of floppy disks no. in all of its systems. Two decades after their heyday, uh, reaching a long-awaited milestone in a campaign to modernise the bureaucracy. Digital Minister Taro Kono, <laughs> who has been vocal about wiping out fax machines and other analog technology in government, said, "We have won the war on floppy disks." Um, um, obviously, uh, Japan's seen as this futuristic kind of um, escape wonderland, uh, mm. wonderland uh, but uh, the, the truth could not be further from it because everything's about handcore stamps and floppy disks. But uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> workplaces obviously still use uh, fax machines over emails. Uh, but um, yeah, the, 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 a lot of um, a lot of like the Japanese kind of administrative kind of forces uh, kind of ran f- until very very recently uh, or on floppy disks. Um, Japan's digitized uh, effort has run into massive snags. Um, apparently, the contract uh, contact tracing app flopped during the pandemic because nobody knew how to use it, or it just sort of fell over quite a lot, and it was just quite quite old school. Um, and they just seem to sort of overcomplicate a lot of uh, oh. a lot of processes. But uh, yeah, Japan has finally seen off. Um, the use of floppy disks in in all of their different administrative uh, areas, which I think is it's it's a positive step, but. You know, it's probably it's you know it's probably safer in this uh, hacky digital world. It probably <laughs> keeping is keeping yeah. it keeping it on uh, kind of little USB keys or something that you can think, lose on the train. I think I read just yesterday that like uh, ICBM, you know, intercontinental ballistic missile silos still run on mm. floppy disks yeah. and technology from the seventies and eighties, and mm. it's almost more secure, isn't it, than having like a Skynet esque yeah. internet system in Wi-Fi. place? Wi-Fi. So, I think yeah, I heard that. Wi-Fi. Um, did, <laughs> I, I I read that um, uh, 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 F1 cars have IP addresses. F1, you know car? that? What? Like no. you could, you could, you could. I think, and the F1 heads will disavow me of this notion. But uh, I say I read it. It was on Linus Tech Tips. Uh, <laughs> I just literally watched a YouTube video about it. Um, but uh, yeah, apparently um, cars have been engines have been destroyed by hacking in the past. So. Um, huh. Yeah, like if, if you accidentally kind of, um, I don't know, run a, I don't know, a firmware update while a race is happening um, on on the wrong car, um, you can you could you could potentially um, damage the engine and basically just kill switch the engine by hacking it. Get a floppy disk. Something to do, isn't it? It's powered by a floppy disk, isn't it? Yeah, as you drive past, you could, you could absolutely chuck a floppy disk at him. <laughs> driving around. I wonder if uh, floppy disks will have the same nostalgic kind of uh, revival as we've seen with like cassettes and uh, records. Mm. I suspect the answer is no, because floppy disks no. were pretty ugly, if I recall. I haven't seen a floppy disk in a long time, actually. I don't know. I don't even really know where they're used in, like, where are they used in Japan? I think it's mainly like government offices and things that yeah, they use. Like but, old, um, yeah. I think I think it must be like archi- like really old archived um, material that hasn't been digitised. Because if you're like a company or, or, or a, a government agency that just is mm. constantly working, you don't have time to sort of, sort of revolutionise how you're holding a lot of this data. And you're like, look, the data's secure, the data's over there, the data gets backed up, um, but we don't have the time to get it from one format to, to, to another, basically. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really interesting stuff. I, I loved... I went from, like, my Amsterdam CPC kind of... Um, 
sort of hard uh, packaged kind of floppy disks mm. uh, I never used the big 512 uh, ones that everyone uh, spoke lovingly about um, or whatever they were called um, the, the like the really floppy kind of big ones that uh, are about yeah, the size of like a half, a, a half Air Force sheet um, but my kind of era was very much the Amiga uh, playing uh, Monkey Island a video game that had 11 floppy disks Jesus um, was a real uh, was a real pain in the bum <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I do remember playing like video games in the nineties, and it'd be like insert floppy disk six, and you'd have to like take it out, put it in. <laughs> yeah, God, wild, isn't God. it? I feel like of all the things to declare victory over, it, it does. You do wonder, like, isn't, isn't there aren't there more pressing issues going on at the moment in Japan that they mm. out like getting rid of floppy disks? Apparently not, mm. though. Apparently not. And the digital minister, the guy that's overseeing it, Taro Kono, he's uh, it's quite it's quite likely he'll be a prime minister at some point because he's quite politically charged and people like right. him and whatnot. Um and what a great what a great campaign <laughs> cat headline. Got rid of those floppies. To to battle. Yeah, I got a floppy discs. Yeah. I'm so brilliant. <laughs> people will love him for it. The people will rejoice mm. for Taro Connor. <laughs> uh, we we'll back this moment guys with your stories, comments and questions over in the fax machine. Wow. Now we're back with the fax machine. What do we got this week from our listeners, Mr Dolson? Got a message from Greg in Kansas City, USA. Greetings from the BBC. Uh, oh, steady. Greetings from the BBQ, barbecue capital of the world. BBC capital. The British, the, the British Broadcasting, <laughs> British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, what's your impression on how Japanese citizens view the current state of their country's technical progress? Well. No more floppy disks, clearly. Um, while there have been some uh, yeah, notable advances in the area of robotic dinosaur tech in the hospitality industry, for perhaps some important stuff I'm forgetting, it definitely seems like they're lagging in certain areas uh, using fax machines, hand cost stamps, etc. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, like the new story, it, like <laughs> they're, they're regarded as being quite futuristic, but the truth couldn't be further from it. If you've ever tried to get any money out of your bank, the process is painful arduous and mm. you know there's probably an argument to say the longer it takes for you to take any money out of the bank the more money the bank makes because they must they must make like you know millions of pounds every second so if you if they can keep you in that bank with your handcuff stamp scribbling away <laughs> they've just made themselves a million dollars i don't decided. think japanese <laughs> banks make a lot of money actually i think the because uh, yeah. the interest rates are so low they make sort of right um yeah. unfortunately I love the good place, uh, to, good place to borrow. Then presumably, I've got a place to borrow. But I will say, robotic dinosaur hotel is is not a great marker <laughs> of of, what, <laughs> of a country's technological advancement. <laughs> but you know, I think we're in danger sometimes of going too far down the. Japan is overrated as a futuristic place. Like actually, Japan, mm. it it's it things just work. Shinkansen work. Ticket machines work. Hardware works. Like a mm. lot more than the UK. I lament yeah. every time I go to the UK, something just doesn't work for no reason. <laughs> It'll be a toilet, a ticket machine, a vending machine. It's just fucked. It doesn't work. And in Japan, <laughs> everything works like clockwork. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, in certain areas, yeah, fax machines are still used occasionally. Hanker stamps still used for banking. But for the most part, I think Japan is a pretty modern place. And the internet here is certainly, you know, a lot further ahead than most countries certainly the UK yeah. for that I know that much um, and internet here just on my phone when I was in Canada or the UK recently um, using like eSIM or whatever I just it was just a nightmare over there and in Japan no matter where I am on my phone I've got signal like 5G wonder speed internet where I can like download like a movie in seconds so yeah I'd, mm. I'd say Japan it's 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 going back up the leaderboard of technologically advanced countries, I'd say. Um, still probably behind China these days, though, where they can do everything on their phone. Uh, we got one here from Anthony. It says, Ali, Chris, and Pete. When my wife and I were in Japan, we experienced some of the most amazing food and tried everything except katsu kare. I was put off by the plastic mock-up examples in the restaurant windows, as unfortunately it looks like literal crap on a bed of rice. No, oh. I wish they'd dress yeah. up the dish for their displays as I've since tried it in London Japanese restaurants, and I love it. I've noticed that katsu curry rarely features in your food quest, so I was wondering if you eat it much when you're about uh, travelling around the country, uh, and if it the, the taste differs between regions and cities. All the best, Anthony. I think the last time I filmed it in a video, did a video last year on, like, travelling Japan on a budget on in food terms, I can't remember what it's called. Right. Eating out the Katsu Chronicles. Budget. 
The Catch Chronicles. Eating, oh, I can't remember what it's fucking called. Too jet lag. Mm. But it involved like eating food <laughs> on a budget. And we went to Coco Curry House. And it was amazing. And actually mm. on the cycle video, it's coming out this month, hopefully, where Connor and I cycled across Japan. We ate Katsu Curry and it's fucking amazing. It was like the perfect dish. I think we had it on our first day. And it's the perfect dish when you're, you've just cycled 100 kilometers and you want to die. It's, it's so good. It's like... Mm. It's good. That's all you need to know. Eat it. Eat as much it's as good. you can. Eat it. Yeah. Eat it. We got, <laughs> we got one here from Joshua. He says, Ali, Chris and Pete, I have an upcoming trip to Japan in August and I'd like to know if cash is still needed or whether I can rely on car payments for most things. I'm planning to hit your favourite ramen spot in Tokyo, which would be where? Thanks, chat. Oh. I'm a huge fan of the podcast. All the best. Joshua from California. My favourite ramen shop It's in Sendai and it's called Sendai Ko, literally Child of Sendai. And it's quite nice. Oh. The last time I took Connor, he was physically sick after afterwards though i think that might have been the alcohol that did that um <laughs> yeah bring some cash in it pete you're the expert here just bring, bring cash. some cash and yeah bring some cash because um you i think i can't remember the last time i sort of went to a place that didn't accept card but um it's fun though isn't it it's fun <laughs> to have that jingle jangle in your bag on the way home thinking i'm never going to spend this again i'm never coming back it's expensive <laughs> Pocket full of change. I mean, pocket uh, full of change. It's uh, yeah. I just have some cash. Always carry like two hundred dollars mm. on you. Trust me on that. I, I actually, yeah. I think I can get. Seems by like now. a lot, but you can yeah, really yeah. get. I think, I think like the way where you're gonna fall down is like mom and pop kind of um, you know food shops and stuff. Mm. But also those little kind of um, vending machines that do the tickets for the restaurants. I think they're usually cash as well. So usually, uh, you usually fall foul of those. And uh, yeah, taxi 100%. drivers is, is, aren't always up. Yeah, like the small ramen shops, um, make sure you have like a thousand yen note or your flux mm. because they don't take card, <laughs> most of them. So, yeah, that's the only place. Other than that, though, actually, these days you can get around with a card. So, uh, yeah, mm. always carry 200 quid on you. That's it. That's the golden rule. Keep the stories, questions, comments coming in, guys, to Braun Japan Podcast at gmail.com or down in the YouTube comments below. But for now, have yourself a great few days. We'll see you right back here to do it all over again on the Abroad Japan Podcast. Bye for now. <laughs>